గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ వన్ అడా వెల్కమ్ టు జవహర్లాల్ నెహ్రూ ప్లానెటేరియం బెంగళూరు ఇట్ ఈస్ అ ప్లెజర్ టు ఇన్వైట్ యూ హాల్ ఫర్ దిస్ ఈవినింగ్ లెక్చర్ వీ హ్యావ్ జవహర్లాల్ నెహ్రూ ప్లానెటేరియం హ్యాస్ మెనీ అండ్ ఫ్లాగ్షిప్ ప్రోగ్రామ్స్ నౌ వీ హ్యావ్ అన్ అనదర్ న్యూ సిరీస్ రైట్ వీ విచ్ వీ హార్ హ్యావింగ్ విత్ రామన్ రిసర్చ్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ విచ్ ఈస్ కాల్డ్ యాజ్ ఇట్స్ ఇంజనీరింగ్ ఫ్రంటియర్స్ in science frontier sciences so where actually we we will be having a lectures on how technology helps us to build science so in this series we have today a talk by professor reji philip on from the phonograph to the phones so i welcome one and all for this uh, lecture today and also i now i invite professor tarun saurdi director raman research institute to introduce the speaker thank you thank you uh, good evening so let me begin by saying you know uh, raman research institute is very delighted to have uh, started this series of talks uh, this is something that is quite dear to my heart because uh, you know one part that is often missed when we appreciate uh, great scientific achievements is the technology that went behind these uh, discoveries from starting from anything that you can think of you know say galileo's telescope uh, to you know special relativity or anything it's always that the changing frontier of technology has allowed us to discover new aspects of science or new laws of physics or even new laws of biology so this series aims to expose you to the kind of exciting technology that is you know underpins any scientific progress that we make and some of this like today's talk are with you already and it would be interesting to see what it took to get here in terms of those technologies so it's my great pleasure to introduce my faculty colleague senior faculty colleague professor reji philip uh, reji studied in uh, kerala uh, then i mean even his masters and phd for, from the very well known cochin university of science and technology qsat kerala then he went on to a post doctoral fellowship at germany in the university of regensburg he has been a visiting scientist at tifr university of massachusetts boston university of central florida and then in 2000 he joined the raman research institute and currently is a senior professor and heads the light and matter physics theme of the uh, institute his research interests lie in laser produced plasma ultrafast spectroscopy nanostructuring using ultrafast laser pulses and nonlinear optical behavior of material okay these are things you may or may not have heard of but you realize that for a researcher to get to the frontier of this he's an experimentalist you know the fact that he has a passionate interest in electronics and uh, audio and amplified design is critical to you know producing such scientists who then translate this hobby into something that allows them to go far in prof- the profession he you know is a quite smiling guy but with great achievements he has 210 research articles in peer reviewed journals he's mentored several phd students postdocs and visiting scientists and then he has been the reviewer on many international journals uh, american institute sort of uh, physics journal Chemi- american chemical society optical society royal society of chemistry and so on and he loves giving talks and he's given a lot of uh, invited and clean keynote plenary talks over 150 of them but he also loves talking to students and that's something 
so this talk in particular, I should say that, uh, you know, I, I would really think is a unique treat because he gave that to undergraduates, not undergraduates, sorry, high school students who came for a month and month and a half or two of electronics course in RRI during the summer vacation. And this was kind of a talk to excite them about what they learned. And so, you know, I'm really glad that Reggie agreed to give this talk. And uh, so, here's Reggie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tarun, for the kind words of uh, introduction. And I should also thank you in particular for encouraging me to uh, give this talk here today. And also, I thank uh, the planetarium and uh, its authorities for giving me this opportunity here today. So this is a bit different from uh, what I <laughs> normally do for a living. Okay, so this is uh, about, uh, the title of this talk is From the Phonograph to the Phone, the History and Technology of High Fidelity Sound Reproduction. So this is something that has fascinated me for long because I had some interest in electronics and then just happened to meet someone who could guide me through you know, making amplifiers and enjoying the sound that came through that. And then uh, since that time, this happened during my PhD days actually. So after that, I've uh, done a good number of experiments in this. And uh, so, okay, so here I am now giving talks on uh, high fidelity sound reproduction. So thank you all for coming. The contents of this talk will be like, uh, we will just look at recording and playback of audio files or audio and uh, broadcasting the historical perspectives here. And uh, we will look at the analog era. That's where all this started many, many years back, the last century uh, in the uh, 1890, that kind of time. And then the digital era, which is much more um, recent and uh, then we will look at audio system components and topologies. So we look at the amplifiers, speaker systems, home theater, and now there is a comeback of disc records and turntables. So we will look at uh, all these things briefly in a very short time. Now, when talking about audio, the first thing we have to know is the audible frequency range. So this, in general, we say that it spans the area of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, even though it is not really possible for adults to hear anything beyond 14 kilohertz or, or something like that. And when we look at the ear, the structure of the ear, so we see that this is a fantastic uh, a device, I mean, biological device, which has an extremely large dynamic range. Like for example, the threshold of hearing is less than one billionth of atmospheric pressure and the threshold of pain, you can see that it is 10 to the power 13 times the threshold of hearing. So there is no electronic device which can actually have this kind of a dynamic range. And then looking at the frequency range here, we can see that we have very low bass, that is uh, the low frequency effects region. This is particularly important in movies uh, in usual home music, usually we hardly ever reproduce these kind of frequencies because it's very difficult. That you need a lot of power and you need really big speakers if you really want to reproduce anything in, uh, in that range. So then 50 to 100, you have uh, musical instruments. There are a few. These are the very low notes that's we, that we usually hear in any home system. And then this we hear usually in theaters or we feel it in theaters. Then uh, we have uh, several instruments, then the human voice, everything in this region, and it goes above uh, something close to 10 kilohertz, something like that. Now, this is uh, something important in audio, the fletcher munson curves. So or these are also known as the equal loudness contours. So what we understand from these um, curves is that the sensitivity of the ear is not exactly same, exactly the same for different frequency ranges. So you see that in the three to four kilohertz region, in this region, the sensitivity is much higher compared to the sensitivity that you have at the low frequencies. So in particular, 
in the very low frequency region, 20 hertz, 30 hertz, 40 hertz, and all that, you really need a lot of power from your speakers to hear it because the sensitivity is low there. So what normally happens is that if you want to have a flat frequency response, which is one of the requirements for a good audio system, then it is obvious that you have to amplify the lower frequencies with higher power. I mean, your, most of your power, you can see that actually goes into amplifying the lower frequencies. Amplifying the higher frequencies and amplifying the middle frequencies is not as difficult. I mean, the power that you spend there is actually much lesser in comparison. Now, mostly, this is for reproducing music, and that's a difficult uh, kind of audio that you have to reproduce, because in music, particularly where there are instruments also, you have a lot of frequencies there, and just looking at a piano, basic piano, this is what you have the octave here. It's an octave scale, as we know. It's also known as the chromatic scale, and the frequency gets doubled in every octave. So the C here has a frequency which is half of the C here, and the next C will be the double of this. And we, uh, we know, I mean, this is, these notes are denoted by C, C sharp, D, D sharp, like that, that's how musicians uh, um, say. And so this is, uh, this is the frequency scale here on the y-axis. You can see that it is logarithmic because of this multiplication. And uh, from C4 to C5, this is how the notes uh, change in frequency. So one can also show this in a circular form like this. And there are 12 notes. If you just count from one C to the next C, you can see that including the half notes, there are 12 notes. And the frequency of any knot on the piano or on the harmonium is the frequency of the previous knot multiplied by the 12th root of two. So this is the, uh, this is the mathematics of music. music. So two, two to the power, one by 12 is approximately 1.06. So there is some small difference between the Indian musical notes and the Western musical notes. Just one hertz here and there, that kind of difference, that's all. So this is the piano. It has seven and one quarter octaves, 88 keys, and it can reproduce frequencies from 27.5 hertz to 4186 hertz. This is much wider than what a human being can ever produce. And here is the harmonium. And this is our uh, Sairi Gama, our, our, our frequencies, the Indian, Carnatic, or Hindustani music frequencies. Now let us look at the history of uh, musical reproduction, or even sound reproduction. So this person, around the 1850s, well, I should say that he is not the only person. There are a different, different people used to work in all these things, but you don't happen to know every one of them. So he has been, his work has been recorded. And he devised something called the phone autograph. Uh, his name is uh, Edward Leon Scott. In the 1850s, the purpose of, was to visually record the vibrations of the human voice. So what he did was he made a device like this. So vibrations were made by speaking into the large end of a megaphone whose small end was a thin diaphragm that could freely vibrate. And a thin brush attached to the diaphragm would make tiny tracks on blackened glass. So you can see this is blackened glass, and these tracks were the original sound ever recorded on some medium. However, these were used only for studying human speech. He was uh, somebody who was studying speech, human speech. Nobody actually thought at that time that it could be possible to reproduce sound by this technology. So then comes uh, Edison, of course, very multifaceted uh, genius. So he recorded sound on tin foils around 1877 and played them back. He called that instrument the talking machine, and he sold many talking machines. It was so fanciful that people were seeing something like this for the first time. You can imagine the excitement. And then, uh, and the recording was uh, vertical recording. I mean, later we see that horizontal or lateral recording also comes into uh, the industry. So he started after the tinfoil. He immediately found that the tinfoil is not the best 
medium for this. Then he went to wax cylinders and for recording and named disc device the phonograph in 1887. So this is, these are his uh, original phonographs. So this is the wax cylinder. What you can see there in, in blue color is actually the wax cylinder. And then there is a needle which is uh, on this arm and uh, you can play this and when you play that you will get back the sound which is recorded on the wax cylinder. And we will see that uh, the kind of stuff Edison made. Uh, I'll show you some other photos also. Now anyway, this was the time of acoustic recording from 1888. Around that time, the technology of recording was kind of um, uh, sort of established. And in most days, this was the way uh, uh, even orchestras, symphony orchestras were recorded. So you have a huge horn and you play into the horn. The, the, the guy who sings, you know, it's like the dramas which, which used to be staged in India in maybe a century before. Like these are called ballets and then, you know, there are no microphones, no sound systems. So the singer has to have a very powerful throat. If you don't have a powerful throat, you are not a singer. So that was the way things were in those days. So the singer sings into this and then, you know, all the instrument plays along with him. And imagine you cannot make a mistake. If you make a mistake, you do the whole thing again. So that was a situation maybe up even 30, 35 years before, even at that time it was a situation until digital recording came. Uh, so this acoustic horn, uh, which was used like this for recording, and then you could play back the whole thing and you can have another acoustic horn on the playback device. So uh, that used to give a reasonable sound so that you can hear whatever was recording. In fact, uh, you can still hear the acoustic recordings of those days in the internet. There are some resources. So now comes something called the graphophone. And uh, because in addition to Edison, the Volta laboratory team, they were also working on wax cylinders for recording and playback. So, and they called their device graphophone. And both groups, in fact, obtained patents for this. However, somebody by the name Emil Berniner, he took patent for, the gramophone patent is actually in his name because he used a disc instead of the cylinder. So what we all have seen, I don't think anybody of us has ever seen a wax cylinder, but disc, all of us, most of us, at least some of us have seen. And uh, uh, Punjab Agashen sir has actually brought his uh, uh, record player and uh, a few discs also here, which we can see after the talk. So, and that's when you can see, instead of uh, the cylinder, now you have the disc playing here, and again you have the horn. This is what you see on the roadside, people selling. They claim that this is 200 years old and all, but it's made in some factory nearby. And, but it's a kind of a replica of what was there in old days. Uh, so that's what it was. And the original record disc was made of zinc, and it played on a turntable using a steel stylus. The recording was lateral. Lateral means the, the groove. In the groove, the stylus moved like this instead of moving up and down. Sync, anyway, did not last long. It was later replaced by shellac. So the shellac records is what uh, people like me have seen in our childhood. Now, look at all the advertisement, everything. So Edison was trying with all his might for selling uh, his uh, phonographs, and a lot of them were sold, actually. People were very excited about this technology. And now the gramophone gives way to the record player. That is with the coming of electricity. By 1925, electricity is available. And uh, Edison also was very, very busy with uh, developing his electricity supply system uh, and all. So in between, he could not spend too much time on his acoustic recording technology. Anyway, many people were working. So the gramophone, it used 78 RPM shellac disks. That's, uh, these disks will run at a speed of 78 rotations per minute. So that was a very standard speed for them. And noisy, and uh, you have about four minutes play on one side. And so both sides, one song each. So you will uh, have two songs on your record disk. That's the way it is. After electric recording, the record player came. And then immediately, the uh, long play records also came. 45 RPM used to be called EP, extended play, I think, and 33 and 1 by 3. That was the speed, RPM. 
that was the LP, Vinyl Records. So Columbia, there are many, many, many companies there. Less noise and about 22 minutes play per side. So you can have five songs or um, something like that uh, on, on every side of the record. So you can get comfortably eight songs, something like that. And LP stereo, then stereo comes. I mean, until this time, everything is mono, but then stereo comes with uh, two, uh, the stylus has two tips like that. Several record labels were there, and Universal, Sony, Warner, Columbia, Atlantic, RCA, Capital, HMV. I think in India, we are familiar with HMV, his master's voice. So that's uh, a dog eagerly looking at the horn because he heard his master's recorded voice on his horn. So that is the emblem of his master's voice. And the term gramophone is actually what uh, led to the Grammy Awards by the Recording Academy eventually. So the stylus which was used in uh, these record players was something like this, mostly made of uh, diamond, sometimes by sapphire also, and then the cartridge which actually housed this stylus could be ceramic or magnetic, which means if you have a ceramic cartridge, then the signal that is generated by the stylus is piezoelectric. I mean, it is piezoelectric signal. And the piezoelectric signal could be as high as 0.5 volt to 3 volt. That kind of voltage it could generate. But the problem was it's not really very good for hi-fi audio or anything. You can hear it, but not really for high fidelity audio. Uh, however, the magnetic cartridge, which worked based on electromagnetic induction, so they were far better in this. And only problem is that the voltage output is very low. Like it's only one millivolt up to five millivolt. And to amplify this is a huge task because this kind of very low voltage, we have a lot of electromagnetic interference around us, so which is more than this voltage. So whatever voltage is generated right at the cartridge has to be amplified there itself using a very small preamplifier. However, this technology picked up and uh, later on, almost all the LP records and all record players actually played using the magnetic pickup. So styli with different shapes you can see here, round, uh, pointed tip, and all kinds of uh, things were being sold at that time. Now, along with this, the magnetic tape also started developing. So I don't know how many of you have seen the reel tape, reel-to-reel -reel tape. So these are bigger tapes, and there are real tape players, and they are actually very good. I've heard a couple of them. The recordings are extremely good, in fact, on the real tape, but uh, you don't normally see that uh, very common. It's a bit uh, old. What many of us know is the cassette tape. So the cassette tape is a miniaturized version of the real tape, and the technology is the same. It is magnetic recording again, and uh, this technology, in fact, picked up a lot, and I think maybe 20 years back, everybody was using cassettes. They were very convenient, small cassettes, and you know, very, very, very nice players, dual deck and all that came. And one advantage with cassettes was that it was very easy to record something. If you want to copy one, uh, one song, you could easily copy it. So you also had demagnetizing tapes and all that because this runs over uh, a tape head, as you see here, and the tape head, it has a coil inside like this. So you have a magnet and a coil. So when the recorded tape moves over this, the magnetic field variations will induce a current here, and that current is amplified. So therefore, this is the play head. Actually, this head is a stereo head because you can see two rectangles here, and that is for reading two tracks, okay. And you can reverse your tape also. You can just flip it like this, so that side also plays. The same way as the LP record, both sides will play. So that was uh, what it was, and we have uh, did a lot of, uh, done a lot of experiments on these things. So, uh, I mean, we used to go to Cochin and buy the, uh, you could buy these mechanisms, you know, cassette mechanisms there. And then we would try different heads. You know, there were heads called glass head, uh, which was supposed to be, uh, it was good quality, very good quality, in fact. 
So we used to buy them and then wire them up. So this is how you have to use shielded cable because again the voltage here is very low. So you don't want to uh, have noise coming in. Then you need uh, a preamplifier right there. And this kind of a preamplifier was very popular. So it used this IC called LA3161. I don't know whether these things are now uh, in use because the technology has kind of disappeared completely from the market. And you also had the erase head. When you wanted to erase whatever was recorded on the tape, you could just press a button and you could erase the whole thing. So it was all very easy. Now, coming to radio broadcast, uh, uh, the senior people here might have seen these kind of uh, old radios which were based on valves or tubes. So uh, these radios were what we had in our homes and or what our parents had or what our grandparents had in those days. So these were the valves, but for audio, in, I mean radio, uh, stereo, everything, these valves were being used. And these radios, I mean, they were very, very good pieces of art again, like, you know, I mean, made of wood. So you have a very good, uh, uh, and the front, there is a kind of a cloth here. Then you also have something called a magic eye. So when you tune to a particular station, so nowadays all tuning is push button, right? So the magic eye was giving, uh, you can look at the magic eye and looking at the breadth of uh, uh, that light, when it's the thinnest, you have tuned exactly to your station. So it had some feel, those things. So uh, now, uh, and in those days, see, there was no satellite. This, I'm talking about days before 1975 and all that. We did not have the communication satellites in those days. So that was the time when I was in school. So the way we used to go to school, I mean, you switch on the radio in the morning. So you don't really need to look at the clock or anything. From the programs, you know what's the time. So this uh, Malayalam news broadcast comes from Delhi at 7.25. And that's the time I have to get out of my house to get the bus to go to school. Otherwise, I'll miss the bus. So, and this news broadcast was so noisy, we could hardly hear anything. The reason was that from Delhi all the way it was coming to Kerala over terrestrial uh, transmission. Repeaters, repeaters, repeaters. A lot of noise. And then one fine day, you see in the newspaper some news. The news is that India is going to launch a satellite, a communication satellite. So what is the advantage? The advantage is that this is going to revolutionize communications. So everything, telephone calls, radio, everything will be much better. So we just saw the news and it passed and maybe even forgot about it. But on one day, a few days later, now the Delhi news, as usual, comes so clear, unbelievable. So it's like somebody is talking to you from nearby. So that was a shock kind of, uh, my goodness, can this be so good? So that was the, see, the impression of the first communication satellite of our country being launched. And it really made a change in the lives of people, at least in this way. There are many other ways in which these satellites help us. So the, and this was uh, around the time, 1978 or something. And then, uh, you know, Radio Ceylon was there. So now Ceylon is Sri Lanka. In Radio Ceylon, there was a half an hour, half an hour program for Tamil, for Malayalam, and all that. So those were all very nice. So this is the mast radiator for a medium wave radio station. The local radio stations are all medium wave, except for FM. So these, uh, because of their wavelengths, they usually have long uh, uh, mast uh, radiators. I mean, these are the antennas they have. And sometimes you can also see them on the roadside whenever there is an AM radio station. So the, it is interesting to note that the very first transatlantic radio transmission happened around 1902 or 1903. And this was done by Marconi. So Marconi was born into a very rich Italian family and uh, aristocratic family, in fact. And uh, he was married to an Irish lady. So he set up. Uh, for this purpose, he set up his antenna in a place called Poldu in Cornwall, England. And you can see the antennas. Um, they are still there, but nowadays these are used only for ham radio. So uh, he set it up there. And then correspondingly, in Newfoundland, there was another antenna. And this was, in fact, the first antenna was supported by kites. You know, I mean, for some reason, they did not build a tower there. So the kite would take the antenna up there. And so then they had to receive the transmissions which happened from uh, England.
So around 1902, he succeeded in transmitting something from England and receiving it in Newfoundland. And then in 1912, we know this uh, big disaster, Titanic sunk, and then in the court proceedings later, the postmaster general of Britain actually said that those who have been saved have been saved through just one man, Mr. Marconi, and his marvelous invention. Because there was a Morse code in Titanic, and Titanic asked for help, SOS messages. I think Carpathia came, uh, or must be Carpathia, yeah, another ship. So, it, it see, several celebrities were invited to travel in that very first trip of, uh, doomed trip of Titanic. Marconi was one of them. But he decided to go three days earlier in another ship. So he was saved. Then TV, of course, terrestrial TV was there. Still, it must be there in remote areas. So these are called Yagi antennas. So you need these antennas for getting TV signals in remote areas when, where there is no cable supply, where there is no satellite uh, connections and all that. So these CRT TVs, cathode ray tube TVs, some of us will certainly remember. And there are different types of antennas, you know, for depending on the purpose, you can have different types of antennas. And usually terrestrial transmission happens somewhere between 52 to 600 megahertz. So this is the VHF and UHF frequency bands. And the Yagi antenna, I mean, it's a very simple antenna, which is quite popular for all the terrestrial transmissions in the TV. And uh, so this was uh, how it was. And then it is, uh, in fact, uh, it so happened that when I was doing my postdoc in Germany, so the local TV antenna was in line of sight for me from my window. So I thought, maybe, why don't I hook up something? And uh, rather than going and buying a dipole antenna or a Yagi antenna from the market, I just managed to I just cut one end of uh, this metal hanger, just fold it like that. That is my dipole antenna. They immediately got seven or eight stations in my TV, like that. So this is the Yagi antenna. And I, I'll tell you a little bit of uh, technology also, uh, not much. So these had booster circuits. So as I said earlier, whenever there is a small signal, when the voltage is not high, you have to amplify it right there. You just cannot afford to amplify the signal somewhere down here because these antennas used to be placed at a height. The Yagi had to be on top of a building and in our areas and all that, it was on top of uh, you know some trees and all that. So the amplifier used to sit right there on the antenna and the power supply to the antenna was going from down. So it's a 12 volt or 15 volt power supply. So this was two pieces uh, were there. And so this is basically what it is. It's a common base configuration because you, the common base amplifier has a relatively lower input impedance. So you have to match to, this is basically a transmission line because the radio waves are at a very high frequency. So therefore you have to match the impedances. And uh, so this cable, the flat cable, which people used for these kind of Yagi antennas had an impedance of 300 ohms. And uh, so this uh, would match that impedance. So that way, uh, it was mostly the common base amplifiers. Now, there are Yagi antennas even for mobile phone. So, but if you ask the companies, then they actually give you something else. They give you another box, which is an amplifier. So probably they have uh, something similar inside, having never, never opened it. But this is also available in the market. I don't know how effective it is, but it's there in the market. So now comes TV and radio through satellite, as I was telling you earlier. So when it comes to satellite, we have the uplink frequency and we also have the downlink frequencies. These are pretty high, like uh, in the something like from 4 gigahertz to 12 or 14 gigahertz, somewhere, somewhere there. The uplink frequencies in the C band or K band, the C band antennas are the big antennas. I mean, these big dish antennas, we don't see them much these days. Uh, these are the K, K band, KU band. It used to be a KU band in Europe. So these are the K-band antennas. These are what we use nowadays, the K-band antennas we use at home for getting satellite uh, TV. And there are, again, free-to-air channels. Some people don't know this. That's why I'm saying this. 
There are many channels which are free. If you just can make up, um, hook up uh, a dish, and that's not very difficult. You just need a satellite finder, so you can buy that for 300 rupees from market. And uh, then you have buy a, a dish like this, I think that is 400 rupees. And an LNB, LNB is maybe 150 rupees. So you can hook up everything together in 1,000 rupees. Now this will be a good experiment for the school students. You can do this as a project. So what you need to do, just look into the internet. Most of our satellites are in the southern sky. Okay, they are in the southern sky. So you buy all these things, ask your father or mother to give you the funds for this. So buy all the things, hook it up, keep pointing. You can actually find the exact azimuth and uh, everything you can find from the internet. It is there. We have Insat B, Insat C, all those satellites are there. And point it correctly, then your meter will immediately click. You can see the needle going like that when it catches the satellite. And then, then you, will, you will get the signal without much difficulty. This is a good project for many of you. Okay, and it is free. See, all the Dora Darshan channels are free like this. You can get it for free. You don't have to pay. The frequency bands in use are like the low frequency radio. We don't have it in India, I think. I haven't seen on uh, any, any radio, low frequency band, but you can see that in Europe. So this is from 30 to 300 kilohertz. The wavelength is like 10 kilometer to one kilometer. Then the medium wave radio is quite known because, uh, I mean, that's the local radio stations are usually in medium wave. 300 kilohertz to three megahertz. Then high frequency, that is short wave radio. If you want to hear BBC and all that, you know, in those days, you have to tune to the short wave region of the radio, and that will give you uh, like three to 30 megahertz. Then, then VHF. VHF is very high frequency for terrestrial TV. That's like 30 to 300 megahertz. Then UHF, that is for cable, satellite, cell phone, all that, is in the 300 megahertz to three gigahertz region. Now, FM radio comes in between in VHF, so that is 88 to 108 megahertz. Then we also have citizens band, which is ham radio. So ham radio, I, that's a different subject by itself. So uh, you can look it up and you can have a radio station in your own house and you can speak to other hams. Uh, so that ham radio uses VHF and UHF. And these are two different uh, bands. Of course, these are different bands and the cost also is very different for the uh, instruments in these frequency ranges. And it lies in between 1.6 megahertz and 1240 megahertz. So this is uh, sort of uh, the a very brief history of the analog era. Now we come to the digital era, which uh, almost everybody is familiar with. Now we use only the digital stuff. So analog to digital conversion, so ADC, here you have to sample the analog signal at a sufficient rate. So this is your analog signal here. What you do is to sample it. And you get a large number of uh, samples of this like that. And then you have to recreate the sampled stuff into the original analog signal. So ADC and then DAC, that's what you do. Now the fidelity here depends of course on a few factors. Uh, like first of all the sampling rate. So here for the CD, CD audio is what we are normally familiar with. For the CD audio, the sampling rate is 44.1 kilohertz. And for DVD audio, it is at least four times higher, 192 kilohertz. So there itself, you can see the huge difference between CD audio and DVD audio. And for, for example, samples per second is 44,100 for CD and 192,000 for DVD. And sampling resolution can be 16-bit for CD audio. For DVD audio, it is 24-bit. So therefore, the number of possible output levels in CD will be 65,000 and odd, and the number in DVD audio will be much higher than that. So here is a comparison, as you can see. So to take advantage of the higher quality DVD audio disc, one needs a DVD player which can play the same thing with a 192 kilohertz, 24-bit DAC is required. So many systems, the commercial systems that we buy, they usually don't have this kind of uh, resolution. 
So therefore, some people actually buy DACs. You can buy, buy the DAC and you can use it, but then you also need something called a CD transport. Now the storage capacity of media are like, uh, you know, here you see one Blu-ray, which has a capacity of 50 gigabyte, and here is, uh, that is equivalent to 10 DVDs, because one DVD has a capacity of 4.7 GB, and one CD has a capacity of only 700 MB. So you can see that one Blu-ray disc is equivalent to 71 CDs. So the advantage here is that if you want to have a movie in high resolution, let's say an HD movie with uh, Dolby Digital or something recorded with uh, five, six channels of audio, all that, you need a lot of storage space. So how the technology works here is that for CD, you have uh, the, the, you know, the pits which are recorded on the CD, they are well spaced, and also you use 780 nanometer uh, laser for writing and also reading this data. Now, compared to that, you use 405 nanometer, that's why it is called a Blu-ray. Actually, you know, this is red, and uh, this is not even blue, it's, uh, it's in fact violet, but companies have called it Blu-ray. So, uh, the advantage here is that those have a smaller, only nearly half the wavelength, and also on the Blu-ray, the recording pits are much closer in comparison. So therefore, you can put in much more data on a Blu-ray. So you can see that movies, entire movies actually come in one Blu-ray, or you know, longer movies, like three hours, three and a half hours, they come on two Blu-rays. There are some one and a half hour movies come on one Blu-ray, that's it. Now, in digital, you have a lot of possibilities, unlike in analog where you don't, you practically can't do anything about the recording once it is done. In digital, you can compress it, you can do various things. So there are uncompressed audio is probably the best because you don't lose anything there. The original sampling rate, the original um, uh, qualities will be there. So that is what you normally say compact disc audio or CD. When you buy a CD from the market, it is the uncompressed audio. And in an uh, AV receiver or in um, 5.1 player, sometimes the input, when you select the input, you will see PCM. So that PCM also says it is uncompressed audio. Now, there is something called lossless compressed. This is a kind of a very clever compression. So here, even though you compress your data, you practically don't lose much. So uh, uh, FLAC, is a, is a file like that where you have practically lossless audio. It takes lesser space. Now, real compression, that is lossy compression, MP3, AAC, so all these formats are compressing your data a lot. And therefore, the quality will actually go down. Compared to the CD audio and MP3, if you carefully listen, you can see that the quality is a little lower compared to the original CD audio. So anyways, whatever format you are using, people have generally agreed that 128 kbps, that kind of, uh, that rate is reasonable. It is good enough to hear music well. Anything below that is not really recommended. Something else that we need to know is dynamic range compression because this is, uh, this is a problem with, uh, with the proliferation of uh, mobile phones, actually. After the mobile phone came, people don't really worry about uh, bigger speakers. See, the speakers that you see here, which I made in 1992, actually, they are still playing. And in those days, I mean, we, would, uh, we were very excited to do things of this kind. But nowadays, you hardly find anybody interested. Because for one thing, Chinese products are there. You can get anything for 3,000 rupees. You can get a 5.1 audio system for just 3,000 rupees. And that meets your requirements, basically. So, you know, let's say, and people watch movies on the computer, right? You don't watch uh, on a screen, so you have a small computer. Then you have a small 5.1 system that sits in a, in a corner of your house, doesn't really bother anybody else. And, so, and headphones, so if you are, even if you are not watching a movie, you are using headphones. So nowadays, the engineers are forced to, to master the audio in such a way that it suits the headphones and the smaller systems. 
So that immediately tells us headphones and smaller speakers, they don't have the dynamic range. And also look at the small MP3 players and all that. They cannot really have the dynamic range which is required by music at times. For example, look at uh, symphony orchestras. See, there is the there is the, the bare minimum sound level, there's nothing. The next moment, the entire auditorium will, uh, will be buzzed with uh, a huge, you know, some, something place, okay? Now that's dynamic range. Your tiny earphone can never give that kind of dynamic range. So therefore, what the engineers do, they purposefully compress the audio. So what happens, if this is the range that you really need, they compress the audio to this level. See, this is the drop of, uh, a water drop is falling. You should be able to hear it. But then, in your tiny earphone, you won't hear it. So what they do? They'll raise the level. Similarly, the highest levels, they know that, I mean, you cannot put it in your ear, and also it won't reproduce well without distortion. Compress it down. So raising up, compressing down. So this actually kills music. People who really want to hear music in its original, the original way, the original singers wanted to reproduce it, then you have to really go, even the source itself has to be an uncompressed source. You have to get it uh, from somewhere. Now we will go to uh, a little bit of electronics, that is the systems and the circuits that we usually use for making high fidelity audio. So what are the components of the audio system? So I'm talking about an audio system that you will use at home for your own use. Of course, this can be scaled up for public address systems. It only, the only thing is to, Im to increase the wattage of the amplifiers, which is possible to do. Anyway, this is where we start. So there are signal inputs and usually a preamplifier. Then there is tone control. You know, you have seen tone controls, bass, treble. Then there is a power amplifier, and then there is a speaker unit. So in olden days, the signal inputs used to come from a turntable, uh, a CD player, DVD player, or a cassette player, and all that. But now uh, things have changed, kind of. TV is there, of course. Uh, so now this is, uh, this is the way uh, the slightly advanced amplifier systems have their input. So look at the inputs. The inputs are HDMI 3 to 1. Okay, I mean, let's say that the HDMI input is only one. You don't need three inputs in most cases. So this comes usually from your TV. Your TV has HDMI ARC. Just look for that pin, HDMI ARC. So ARC gives audio out. So that audio you can take and connect your amplifier because if you want to uh, have home theater, you, you have six channels, minimum six channels of audio. So HDMI will give you that. So HDMI ARC is, comes here, then coaxial input, again digital input, then uh, optical input was there, then aux, aux is actually analog input, it is not digital. So all these inputs are the SPDIF, that is uh, optical. So all these things are there nowadays in an amplifier at the input. So in addition to that, you have the FM radio. Then you also have 5.1 channel analog input sometimes. Some cards have it. And then USB port, because most people now hear songs from a thumb drive. So USB port is required. Bluetooth also is required. So these are the newer kind of inputs that you connect to an amplifier. And you can buy this. Actually, the entire board can be bought for, I bought recently one for 1,750 rupees. It's a good board, in fact. And that's a 2.1 board. If you want to buy a 5.1 board for home theater, then you have to pay about 3,000 rupees. So that's the range where it is. So the preamplifier, I will not really go much into this, except to say that the preamplifier has to have all the inputs for I mean, it has to accommodate several inputs, like this. So there will be uh, inputs with level adjustment. Different inputs have different levels. Then input buffer. A buffer is there for matching the impedances. Then tone controls, bass, treble. Sometimes a mid control also is there. And then balance and volume. Because sometimes the stereo channel, uh, the balance won't be there. 
So therefore, you have to balance both channels correctly. Then volume control. So these are the um, basic stuff that you have in uh, these systems. And so these preamplifier boards, these are examples of, uh, this is a full preamplifier from Marantz. It's a preamplifier, a big box. So all that is, this is tube preamplifier. People, some people want to hear the valve preamplifier. They are coming back now, as I told you earlier. So that's it. And uh, this is a Macintosh preamplifier. You can see how many inputs it has. It's a box by itself. So now the power amplifier in the system, typically it's a class AB topology. This is what people normally use for efficiency and also for reasonable distortion free performance. So there will be an input stage. Usually it's a differential amplifier, as you can see here. Then there's a voltage amplifier stage, which is this one. And there is something called a Miller capacitor. This is a local feedback capacitor that you have to put here to reduce the bandwidth. Otherwise, the bandwidth will be so huge that it will lead to oscillation. Then there's an output stage. So this is the output stage. So this is the basic stuff in an amplifier. This is a very well-known amplifier from the uh, internet. There are many forums where people uh, uh, discuss these things. They design amplifiers and all that. So this one by Elliott Sound Projects is something which is very good. And it has very similar kind of uh, uh, topology. This is a different topology. It's a 1970s design by Philips. So this circuit also is very good, in fact. I mean, it has a singleton input stage. It's not differential input. And it has a small Miller capacitor. It's not large. Output is quasi-complementary stage. Then uh, output is capacitor coupled, which is not the case with modern amplifiers. And then there's a global current feedback. Then also, in addition, it has a single power supply rail. So it is not uh, dual like the modern amplifiers, but that is a very good uh, amplifier by every count. Speakers. Speakers are perhaps the most important stuff in a musical system because you can reduce the distortion in almost everything else, but speakers, this, reducing the distortion is not easy because you can have low distortion speakers, but they can be very expensive. They run into lakhs of rupees, the real good ones, so normally we cannot afford them. So we have to live with the normal speakers and try to reduce the distortions and all that as best as possible. So what we do, first of all, there is no single speaker that can reproduce from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. It's a huge frequency bandwidth. So what we do is uh, we divide this frequency bandwidth into two or three. So you can go for a two-way system like that. So the low frequencies go into the woofer. So woofer is this one. And the high frequencies go to the tweeter, which is up here. So the, in the other case, you can have a three-way system where there is a woofer, as usual. There is a mid-range, and also there is a tweeter. So this is a three-way system, originally built as a three-way system. But right now, I have disabled the mid-ranges. So now it is functioning only as a two-way system. I have uh, put the uh, appropriate, I've changed the crossover filters and all that to make it a two-way system. So the crossover filter you need here because you have to channelize the correct frequencies to the correct drivers. So that is what you use the crossover driver for. Then, uh, you know, these crossover filters, so uh, this is the way they behave. Uh, you have frequency on the x-axis and the attenuation on the y-axis. So there are low pass, high pass filters, band pass filters, notch filters. You can use them depending on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 the, um, uh, on the exact use. So uh, the structure of a three-way passive crossover is like this. So the input goes from here. So there are different filters. So one goes to the woofer, other goes to the tweeter, then it goes to the mid-range. There are different orders of filters, like uh, you know, first order, second order, third order. So the response also will be like this. It will become uh, steeper and steeper as you go to the higher filter orders. And then uh, the phase response also you have to worry about. So it is not, not really a good idea to really go for the really higher order filters. You have to strike a compromise between the phase uh, group velocity dispersion 
and other things. So normally, uh, one usually is happy with a second order filter. That's what I am usually happy with. And this is how you know you equalize the frequency responses. So if you have a two-way system, you will make sure that over the entire frequency range, you have um, the uh, you know, a flat frequency response curve. And this is the subwoofer for the very low frequencies, something like this. And uh, so you can cut the frequency for 80 or 100 hertz. So all the frequencies below that, something like uh, this can work down to 40 hertz or something. So it is like that. So here you can see the photographs of uh, two-way systems, three-way systems and all. And this is a normal 2.1 stereo system at home. <coughs> so you have the TV here. You have the two channels, left and right, and then one subwoofer. This is called a 2.1 system. The point 0.1 is for the subwoofer. So this is good normally for uh, music. If you want to watch movies, then uh, if the movie is encoded in uh, home theater, like 5.1, then you need two more speakers for this. I'll come to that. OK, so you can have active crossovers also. Usually we use passive because that is cheaper. If you go for active, that actually gives you better response. And uh, OK, I'll, I'll just skip this second order. This is here. In this system, actually, I have passive crossovers. Um, which is uh, designed. This is the one which was designed for this particular system, which is on demo today. And uh, a hi-fi audio system for home can be made like this by the same principles which I have told you. You have the source here, then an active crossover here. Then you have three amplifiers. So <coughs> this is for the subwoofer, and this is for the other two-way or three-way speakers. So these are the same amplifiers I am uh, showing uh, here today. And uh, then coming to surround sound, surround sound formats, there are different formats, like uh, Dolby surround. It was 1982. It was called matrix surround. Then Dolby digital. So this is the most popular one now for home, Dolby digital 5.1. Then DTS. DTS is uh, many, many movies come in DTS and also in Do Dolby digital. Then Dolby Atmos here. In Atmos, you have two speakers above you also. Like in the roof, you will have two speakers. Like, you know, uh, if there is, if you see rain in the, in the screen, then, you know, if you have speakers up there, it will have that uh, feeling. This movie, this very famous movie, I forget its name. It used Atmos, Telugu movie, Big Budget. I forget the name. What was the name? Hmm? Bahubali, yeah, Bahubali had, I think it was recorded in Dolby Atmos. So, uh, then there was another uh, move, another format called Sony Dynamic Digital Surround, uh, sound which uh, never really took off. So this is uh, on film, actually. Some of you might know that Oppenheimer, now everything is digital. Movies come in uh, DVDs, but Oppenheimer, they made some film prints also. Maybe in respect of the old technology, I don't know. So this was a way in film you could record sound. Dolby Digital, SDDS. Everything would be recorded on the film itself, so like this. And uh, this is our auditorium. RRI auditorium is a 7.1 system. So we have the uh, screen here, then front left, front right, uh, center channel for audio uh, uh, speech. Then uh, so two uh, 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 channels here and also two here. This is called a 7.1 setup. You can make a low-cost DIY home theater system, uh, but I'm not really going into all those details. If somebody is interested, you can ask me, then I'll tell you. It is not very expensive. Buy a small 7,000 or 10,000 rupees projector. Uh, you can buy them. Uh, they are available in Amazon. And uh, then, uh, uh, then you should have some program source, like uh, even the STB. You know, if you have a satellite cable connection or whatever, which most people have, or even the HDMI, app, HDMI output of your TV, you can use it. And then take it to a 5.1 amplifier, the speakers. Uh, there is this company called FND, Chinese. So I like that company because FND produces, their sound quality is good, even though they are not very expensive. So people who want to buy 5.1 amplifiers, to, they can try FND. So uh, this is what basically it is, and uh, this is what I use at home, my 8,000 rupees projector and uh, an Xbox 
which belongs to my son. That's a good streaming device. And then uh, my Blu-ray player and also my AV receiver. So everything I hook up and uh, that's what. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of uh, this talk. What are the recent trends? There are some recent trends in audio. Now we all know about the advantages of transistors over valves. I mean, they are far better on many counts. But however, people like, uh, people are nostalgic. All of us are always nostalgic. So when you don't see the gramophone, or the turntable for a long time, you feel like uh, having it again, okay? So now, <laughs> because of this nostalgia, and also some people feel that it gives uh, better sound. I mean, there are some reasons for it. I'll say that in the next slide. So um, I also had a good visit to one of uh, the showrooms in Seattle with my brother-in-law in, -law in uh, 2012. Uh, so there, I had the good fortune to meet one engineer and seeing our interest, he took us to an inner room, which is not normally accessible to the normal customers. And just by looking at the room and seeing the things inside, I immediately told him, it is impossible for us to buy anything in this room. So he said, don't worry. We don't see customers who know about the subject that much. So I'm happy to tell you what we have here. This is only for the high profile customers, but you don't need to buy. I'll be happy telling you what it is. So then we spent something like an hour there, and it was a fantastic experience. The real hi-fi stuff is up there. It costs a lot. So what we usually buy from shops and all is uh, very mediocre kind of stuff. That's ma for mass production. Those were really uh, very good stuff. So you see things of uh, this kind. This is from 1961, by the way. But this kind of stuff is now coming back. Valves output transformers, so all those things which had disappeared completely, those technologies are now coming back. And why? Probably because why these things are coming back? It's a good question. So analog record discs, the, they are basically lossless because analog technology is lossless, so therefore there is no loss there. But then, but then um, normal CD sound also is lossless to a reasonably good extent, I would say, even though there are losses. The second thing is, the tube amplifiers are almost always class A. So this class A single-ended, there is class A push-pull, but class A single-ended. Some people claim they are very good. Well, I haven't heard one. So this is true, there is no crossover distortion because there is no, only one device there, there is nothing to crossover. So no crossover distortion. And any distortion it produces is second harmonic. Even harmonic, second, fourth, like that. That kind of distortion is actually, you know, it's a good distortion. There's a good distortion and the bad distortion. The bad distortion is where you have odd distortion, like, you know, third order, fifth order, and intermodulation distortion, transient distortion. Those guys are not good. But uh, this guy, first of all, this is small wattage. So you never play it about 10 or 15 watts. Therefore, even if there is distortion, you are not going to hear it. Secondly, whatever distortion is there, it is second harmonic. So uh, apparently, this gives a fullness or warmth to the sound. So that's why people like old valve radios, uh, you know, uh, these record players. And this is the reason why people like it. So, uh, and also that feedback applied is less, which some people claim. That is also important, but I'm not really very sure about it. There are, there's a lot of difference of opinion, a lot of fights happen in forums on these things, and so it's very, very interesting to really read and write there. Okay, so just wanted to say, vinyl is now selling more than CDs in the US. All uh, the things are coming back. Now the LP records are coming back, and they are selling more than the CDs now. So uh, these are all some hi-fi manufacturers. We, only a few of these we have uh, heard, like Bose, Sennheiser, Sony, JBL. So this is all the lower side, actually, if you really look at it. Bowers and Wilkins. I heard these speakers in Seattle. It costs in Indian rupees 55 lakhs. It's a completely in a different league. There is no comparison. So therefore, I cannot compare this with anything. It was like... Uh, <laughs> completely of a different world. So, I mean, uh, we can only see them. I mean, I'm happy that I could hear it. 
So uh, there are a few companies like that which make very premium products. They make only only the very premium products, nothing else. And uh, they also have uh, clients for it. Okay, I think I am uh, the references here. My talk is over. So these are my references for this talk. I mean, there is a beautiful book, Audio Amplifier Systems, in 1970, written by Philips Engineers. Then Douglas Self, he is a master in audio power amplifier design, even though not everybody needs to agree with him on uh, some of his uh, stands. Then I like uh, articles by Rod Elliott a lot. A lot. Um, in fact, I met him in uh, Sydney, and we spoke for more than an hour. And uh, he's a fantastic guy. He has written lots of articles in the internet. Anybody who wants to learn more about amplifiers, just go to his site. Everything is there. And then uh, DIYAudio.com, an excellent uh, resource for you know all kinds of uh, discussions. And then internet, Wikipedia, and all that. I have to thank uh, our engineers in RRI, Sujada and Meena, for helping me with uh, some of these <coughs> uh, hardware support for uh, for me assembling those circuits. And Kannan, our RRI carpenter, and uh, Rod, of course, and I met him. And Joni Isaac is like a guru in electronics for me, and he is a professor in Kusat. And my students, Sandeep and Smijesh, my faculty colleagues who were interested. Then uh, Vidwan B.S. Anand, Maleshwaram, my music teacher, and my family for tolerating uh, <laughs> all these uh, loud sounds and, you know, crying transistors and everything. I mean, they have been, my wife is right here, and so, and <laughs> so I thank them also for, for all this. So thank you so much for your very kind attention. And maybe I'll just play this, uh, I mean, this is just... Uh, Please don't expect anything spectacular, I have to tell you, for two reasons. One is it's a modest amplifier and modest speakers. I, as I told you, the origin, this was built uh, during my PhD days in 1992 uh, with Johnny Isaac. He, he gave me the directions. And, and the amplifier also, the original version was built at that time, the same Philips circuit, which um, even now with some small modifications, I use the same thing. And this, this, uh, is not really an acoustic environment because you know those who know know that you have to have a rectangular room uh, small sized because I mean you have the huge speakers here that said it's a public address system it is not a home system okay so they won't be very loud or they won't play as well as they play in the home but uh, anyway just to show you how much sound it can produce and it also it can produce reasonable quality, I will just uh, play it. So don't worry about the noise. That noise is because everything is open. I haven't grounded it properly. Once I do it, the noise will disappear. So we also have the record player and discs by Panchapakeshan, sir. Would you like to display that here? For, yeah. So for those who haven't seen it, so we will try to play a record. So you can see the record here. This is something special. Holding one in my hands after maybe 20 years or so. <laughs> yeah, you can see. It's also a recording machine by Sony. 